Section 9.9, .9, Areas of Regions Bounded by Polar Curves. So if we think back to Calc 1 for a minute, we know that to find the area under a function defined by a rectangular equation like y equals f of x, the scheme was always to chop off a region by using vertical lines, let's say at x equals a and x equals b, and then of course we made a partition of that interval, we constructed rectangles, whether those were circumscribed or inscribed rectangles, uh, we constructed a series of them, and so on, and of course we formed a Riemann sum. The Riemann can sum consisted of widths of those rectangles times heights of those rectangles, and those heights were obtained by taking function values at selected values within each subinterval. We took the limit as n went to infinity, which created more and more subintervals, and the idea was to fill in the space under the curve with rectangles that conformed more closely the more of them there were to the shape of the curve. And of course this was our original definition for the so-called definite integral a to b f of x dx, which we interpret as area under the curve. Okay, in this section it's the same idea, except now we have a polar curve. So let's say we have some r equals f of theta function. Now we're not going to try to chop off a section using vertical lines. Uh, obviously the only thing that would make sense there if we're drawing verticalized vertical lines we're thinking about measuring distances this way which means we're again thinking about y values measured in terms of x's according to what the function says. Okay, we know that's not going to work because of the way this polar function is generated. It's generated by picking a theta, and that theta implies a certain r. That theta and that r lead to that location on that polar curve. And as theta varies, the function r equals f of theta determines all of these different points at various distances from the origin, and the collection of all those points is the curve. All right, in fact, if you look at the picture, the picture kind of suggests what sort of region I could find the area of. Notice if I deleted a couple of these, uh, well, let's leave that one on the end in there. It seems like it would be reasonable to talk about finding the area of a region where the boundaries aren't vertical lines, but are radial lines emanating from the origin. Uh, that makes sense because, of course, those radial lines emanating from the origin would be constant fixed values of theta. So say this lower blue line is theta equals alpha, and let's say this upper blue line is theta equals beta, then of course it would, might, it would probably make sense for me to talk about finding the area in between those two radial lines and inside the polar curve. So the region formed by the polar curve, the two radial lines, theta equals alpha and theta equals beta, and the polar origin, the pole. All right, to do that, of course, I'm not going to use rectangles, but I am going to follow the usual scheme, which in the case of regular Riemann integrals from Calc 1, it was to partition that interval into x values. Okay, this time, of course, what I should do is partition this theta interval, that is the interval from alpha to beta, into subintervals. And of course, when I do, what I get is these little wedges. And of course, each one of those little wedges has some curve out at the end which of course is just that little piece of r equals f of theta on that little subinterval. Okay, so that means we're talking about taking the interval from alpha to beta. We're talking about chopping it up. And we could write this down just like we did in Calc 1. We could call this one something like a, let's say, 
theta sub zero. We could call this a theta sub one. We could call this a theta sub two and so on up to this last one we could call theta sub n which means we would be dividing this sub this interval into n sub intervals if we looked at just one of those let's explode that view a little bit and let's say i look at the interval that goes from theta sub k minus 1 to theta sub k that would be the kth one of those sub intervals notice this first sub interval that ends in theta 1 that's the first sub interval the interval that ends in theta sub 2, that's the second subinterval, and so forth. And of course, this one down here at the end that ends in theta sub n, which is the same as beta, that would be the nth subinterval. Let's say I pick a representative subinterval, the kth one, and if I look at that wedge, just that one derived from the subinterval, uh, what sort of picture do I see? Well, I see two radial lines emanating from the origin, uh, some sort of polar curve out here that's doing something. This would be theta equals theta sub k minus 1. This would be theta equals theta sub k. And what I want is that area of this piece. And of course, if I add up all n of those, I've got the area of my polar region. Now the question is, how do I do that with that ragged function out at the end, that r equals f of theta? Okay, that color is really gaudy. Let's not do that. Well, think about how you did it in Calc 1 with the curve up here. You chose flat rectangles because by choosing a rectangle, you could approximate the area under the curve for a small interval just by choosing the function value at one particular x value within each interval. Okay, here I could do the same thing. I could pick, let's say, some alpha sub k. I'm just picking any number I want in that kth subinterval. And let's say it's this one. I'm just picking something randomly. So let's say that's theta equal alpha sub k. And then let's use that value, that radius value right there, to create a circular arc. So like so. That is where I'm looking at a wedge now, an actual sector of a circle. Now you get the concept here that for very small, uh, let's call this delta theta sub k, that is for a very small subinterval, uh, the approximation of the area inside that polar region is going to get better and better as that theta delta sub k or delta theta sub k gets smaller and smaller. All right, so that's the idea. I'm going to approximate the area inside one of these polar regions by using sectors of a circle. Uh, we know the area of the sector of a circle is one half theta r squared. That is, if I have a circle and I have a central angle uh, of angle theta, let's say, and the circle is of radius r, then I know the area of that circle is one-half theta r squared. Okay, that means in our little picture, this one right here, what is the area of that little circular sector that I've created there? Well, it should be one-half, so let's say this is the area of the, uh, the kth uh, sector, which is this thing I have shaded in the, the gaudy lime green there, whatever that color is. should be one-half times theta. Okay, what's theta? Well, it's actually delta theta sub k. It's this angle. Now, just to make things easy on us, since we're not really going to uh, do these things with actual limits, we're going to turn this into a practical integral formula here in a minute. You remember from Calc 1 that we eventually shifted to regular partitions where these del delta theta sub k's, or up here delta x k's, were all the same. That's what we called a regular partition. Okay, let's do the same thing down here and let's make this a regular partition. 
So let's just talk about every one of these being delta theta. They're all the same width. In other words, what's the width of or what's the angle for every one of these little sectors? It's beta minus alpha over n if there are n of those sectors. And that's what I'm calling delta sub theta or delta theta. All right, so that means down here, what's the area of this sector? It's one half times the angle, which is delta theta times the radius squared. Okay, what's the radius? The radius is this r that we generated by picking a specific angle in this interval and evaluating it in the function. That created a radius and we're using that radius to create a sector that approximates the area of the polar region. Okay, what is that radius then? It's the function value. Remember our function is r equals f of theta. So that would be f of alpha sub k squared. Now, that's just one of the sectors. What do we do with them? We add up all n of them. So let's pull the one half out and say we have a delta or f of delta k squared delta theta. We take the limit as n goes to infinity and we know from what we did in calc 1 that this turns into one half times the integral. Okay now what are the endpoints or the upper and lower limits of the integral going to be? It's going to be the endpoints of my interval, which is alpha and beta. What goes inside the, or what do I have for an integrand? Well, I know this alpha sub k just becomes theta. So that would be f of theta squared. And I know that delta theta becomes d theta. Okay, so to summarize, if I have a polar function, and I want to find the area of the polar region that's generated or bounded, let's say, by the radial lines theta equals alpha, theta equals beta, and the polar curve r equals f of theta, then my area, which is this guy, is going to be one half times the integral alpha to beta f of theta squared d theta. It reminds you a lot of some of those formulas we ran into in the end of Calc 1 when we were finding volumes of solids of revolution. Lots of, of squares because we were getting squares of radii when we were finding areas of circular cross sections. Well this is not quite the same but there again is that uh, very simple formula with just a square of the function. All right, so turns out in the end we have a really simple formula. This is the one that we need to do our job here in this section. So let's look at several examples now just to see how to use this. So let's start out with a really simple one. Uh, let's find the area bounded by r equals 2 plus 2 cosine theta. All right, this is where I go to my graphing utility. I go to my table of common polar graphs, and I figure out what this guy looks like. Of course, if I remember my list, I might immediately key off the fact that those two numbers are equal, which reminds me that this is a cardioid. Okay, just to remind you what that would look like for this graph, um, there's your picture. You can see that when theta is 0, that would be 2 plus 2 cosine of 0, which would be 2 plus 2, which would be 4. Then as theta increases from 0, r is positive, tracing out this curve, until finally I'm pointing upward so that my theta is pi over 2. Well, again, if my function is... Oops. If my function is 2 plus 2 cosine theta, then when theta equals pi over 2, that would be 2 plus 2 times 0, which would be 2, which is exactly where I'm at sitting right here. Now, once you rotate past pi over 2, 
now you're tracing out this part of the curve and of course notice that means that now r is getting smaller in fact by the time I get to pi that is by the time I'm pointing in this direction my r is actually 0 so from 0 to pi I have traced out the top half of this cardioid now notice the the idea here when I think about those little let's call them polar regions actually you can see them if you use these little radial lines as a guide there's one of them right there I see the radial line at pi over 6 follows the curve down to where it intersects that line at theta equals pi over 12 comes back down there's one of them what you should be picturing in your mind is these little radial lines that go out and so the real question is if I'm going to find the area inside this polar curve I need to know what the alpha and the beta are well you should agree that if I start at alpha equals zero that means I'm going to begin filling up the curve with a flat line segment from the origin out here to 4 zero as theta increases and my radial line traces out the curve counterclockwise it's going to fill up the space inside this curve so that means if I integrate from 0 up to pi over 6 and I integrate that formula that 1 half integral 0 to pi over 6 f of theta squared d theta what I would get is the area of the region that goes from the origin out to 4 0 follows the red curve to that point right there where the curve intersects the radial line theta equals pi over 6 and then follows that line back down to the origin that wedge is the area I would get if I integrated from 0 to pi over 6 so if that makes sense you should realize that if I integrate from 0 all the way over to pi over 2 that would give me the area of the top half of this cardioid actually it is a period 0 to 2 pi graph which means if I integrated from 0 to 2 pi that is if I just did a straight integral 0 to 2 pi 1 half 2 plus 2 cosine theta squared d theta that would actually get me the area because I am simply going around this graph filling up the area inside the curve and as R goes around it traces out this curve and continues to fill up the space inside it but you should also notice that there are a lot of other combinations I could use uh, that might be easier for example we said we could do the top half uh, the area of the top half would be 0 to pi okay why am I just doing the top half because I have symmetry I know that the area of this region below the polar curve and above the x-axis is the same as the area down here above this part of the polar curve and below the x-axis so it's very common when you have these symmetries and you've seen this before in calc 1 to exploit that symmetry divide the region into halves or quarters depending on what kind of symmetry you've got and then use that symmetry in this case it would be what that integral is the area of the top half so I would need two of them to get the area of the entire region so there's another possibility the main thing is you're trying to determine a starting point for theta and an ending point for theta that you're certain fill up a portion of the region bounded by the polar curve that you want and if it happens to be half of the overall region that's great you can just exploit the symmetry okay let's do a couple other examples now I'm just going to set these integrals up I'm uh, not really going to evaluate them um, the integration should be pretty straightforward I will say though that I sketched this one out real quickly I can't vouch for the correctness there because I did it very fast uh, but if I'm correct I got 6 pi for that one you can check that and see if that's right okay let's try another one 
let's look at the area inside r equals 3 sine theta, but outside r equals 2 minus sine theta. Oh, I suppose I better put the other back on so you can see what I'm doing there. Okay, there's our problem. The area inside r equals 3 sine theta, but outside r equals 2 minus sine theta. All right, now, uh, again, I would consult my table of common polar graphs, go to Desmos. Uh, I should recognize that this guy is one of those circles that's tangent to one of the axes. Um, you should recognize this one is one of your Limachons. Question is, which one? Is it one of the dimpled ones? Is it one of the loop? Uh, the ratio is not one to one, so it's not a cardioid. Okay, so let's look at Desmos real quick. And I'm not, uh, I have it chopped off where you can't see the, the functions here, but I'll just click to r equals 2 sine theta. Um, the period of that is 0 to pi. And then here's the other function, that's the r equals 2 minus sine theta. And you might recall if that ratio is 2 or more, then that's what we called the convex Limachon. Okay, now let's see. It said we want the area inside r equals 3 sine theta, which is the red circle, but outside the r equals 2 minus sine theta, which is the Limachon. So inside the red closed circle, but outside the green Limachon. Okay, I can't shade it here in Desmos, but we are talking about this region. So the one that starts at that intersection of the two curves, follows the circle, comes back down, hits that other intersection point, then follows this part of the Limachon. So outside the Limachon, inside the circle. So of course this shows you the kinds of problems we, we can ask. We can ask for, uh, given two closed polar graphs like this, we could ask for the intersection of the two, the area of the intersection. We can ask for the area inside one and outside the other, or vice versa. In this case, it's this region here. All right, now, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Quite a lot, actually. Okay, I just realized I uh, have a little mistake in one of my formulas. I had to zoom in to see it. Okay, let's try that. Uh, I had r equals 2 sine theta instead of r equals sine theta. I wasn't paying attention there. And of course, I see that's correct now because I know it should be diameter 3 if it's r equals 3 sine theta. All right, so what I want to ask, and this is just sort of the, the concept here, if I'm looking for this region, I realize where that region starts. It starts here at this point of intersection. And we talked about this at the end of the last lecture, how to find those points of intersection. Now, uh, armed with Desmos, uh, it's going to be pretty easy. In fact, here I'm 100% certain the intersection is at theta equals pi over 6. And the other intersection over here is at 5 pi over 6. But you remember the process uh, if, if I need to resort to it to find those points of intersection. I can set the two functions equal to each other. And then I can use that trick of multiplying r by a negative 1, and then in the function, uh, adding a pi to the theta. And I keep doing that till I get back to the original equation. And we did say that for most of these polar functions, that's really going to boil down to two equations. Uh, usually it's going to be the function equals the other function, or the negative of one of the functions equals the other function. Well, in this case, both of these graphs arrive at pi over 6 at the same time. If you were to uh, use the other Desmos applet that I have the link there for you in my open math, and you watch this being traced out, this green one would start here and trace to that point at pi over 6. This graph, let's see, where does r equals 3 sine theta start? When theta is 0, 
this one starts at 3 times 0, which is here. So as I rotate from 0 and increase, I'm going to be tracing out points further and further up the circle from the bottom here at the pole. I will definitely arrive at that common point at the same theta value for the same positive r. All right, same story over here. The r is positive on both graphs at the same theta value, which means this is a pretty cut and dry situation. Now, is it clear uh, if you ignore the red one for a minute, so ignore the red one, that if I integrated from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, 1 half times the integral of the green function squared, so let me, uh, let me write that for a minute over here. So the green function was this one, and this was the red one, the circle. And so what I'm saying is if I take the green one, which is the Limachon, and I go from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, 1 half times 2 minus sine theta squared with respect to theta. Now let me go ahead and draw a rough sketch of this picture here so we've got something to look at. So, of course, we've got our circle up here of diameter 3. Let's pretend that's a circle. And then we've got our Limachon down here. Looks something like this. And what we're saying is we have radial lines here at theta equals pi over 6. And theta equals 5 pi over 6. And this integral I just wrote here in green uh, should be this area. OK, does that make sense? If I integrate from one radial line, theta equals pi over 6, to another, and the function I'm integrating is this blue one that you see right here, then what I should be capturing is the area of the region uh, between that polar curve and the pole bounded on each side by those two radial lines. All right, now, what happens if I integrate 1 half pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, and I integrate the other function, the, the circle, which was the 3 sine theta? And so I square that and integrate with respect to theta. Okay, now I'm shooting out from the origin and capturing, well, I wanted that in red. I'm shooting out from the origin and capturing this curve, the circle. And so as I rotate from theta equals pi over 6 over to theta equals 5 pi over 6, what am I doing? I'm filling up the circle. Not all of the circle, though, just the portion between these two radial lines that intersect. Okay, which means now I've shaded in everything you see with the red lines. Now, what do I want? I want just this part. I want everything inside the circle, but outside the Limachon, so outside the part that's shaded below in green. And I think you already can anticipate and, and guess what we're going to do here. And it is that simple. So, of course, what I'm talking about is if we think back to Calc 1, we know that if we have two functions where one is above the other, and, of course, it doesn't really matter whether the two functions are both positive or both negative or one's positive or one's negative, if one of them is definitely greater than the other, and that's the one I, I would say is the one on top. And I chop off the region between those two at those two vertical lines, x equals a and x equals b. Then, of course, we know the area in between those two curves and bounded by those two vertical lines is simply the integral a to b f of x minus g of x dx. And, of course, what's the simple reason why? I know the integral of f is the integral or the area 
of the region that lies below the graph of y equals f of x above the x-axis in between the vertical lines. The integral of g I know is the area beneath g and above the x-axis. And obviously if I subtract those two areas, what I get is the area in between the curves, which is the one I'm shading there in blue. All right, and you can see now that I have a very similar situation here. And generically, uh, we, we should just remember this idea. If I have any two polar curves, let's say r equals f of theta and r equals g of theta, where the f of theta is further away from the origin than the g of theta is. So in other words, uh, when comparing r values, we're saying f of theta is the larger one. And I decide to uh, chop off a polar region with two radial lines, say theta, theta equals alpha, theta equals beta, then of course it's the same exact concept that we're talking about over here. If I want to integrate, let's say, uh, the f function, that is one half integral alpha to beta, f of theta squared d theta, that would be that would be all of this area. If I do one half the integral alpha to beta of g of theta squared, I know that would be this area. Let's try a different color for that. Well, that's pretty bad too. That would be this area. I understand that if I subtract those two areas, I'm going to get the area in between the two curves and between those two radial lines which is the area you see there in yellow still. All right, so the same idea that we had over here, except what's the only difference? Instead of f of x minus g of x, it's going to be f of theta squared. Actually, this is the f here. f of theta squared minus g of theta squared. Okay, how do I know which is which? Which one is further away from the origin? Which one is the outer boundary of this region? It's obviously... Um, this one, and then the inner boundary is this part. So the inner boundary is the Limachon, which is this guy, and the outer boundary is the circle, which is this guy. So my formula should be what? The area is 1 half integral pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, outer boundary squared, which is the circle, minus inner boundary squared, which is the Limachon. And I'm going to integrate that with respect to theta. All right, now I am not going to do the detail, and you should check this for yourself. I did this very quickly, so again, I can't vouch 100% for this answer, but when I did it really quickly, I got an answer of 3 squared of 3. So you should check that and see if that's correct. But uh, again, we're just trying to uh, figure out how to work out these formulas. Okay, so the thing we've introduced with this example is the idea of finding the area between two polar curves. I just need to know which one is the outer boundary, which one's the inner boundary, and then I need to figure out uh, what my boundaries for theta are, that is the upper and lower limits of the integral. Well, in this case, that involved finding points of intersection, which it, it often will in problems like this. Okay, let's try another one. Um, let's try finding the area of one petal of r equals 3 cosine 3 theta. Okay, first of all, if you, uh, without looking, if you can remember, when you see something like a sine or a cosine of n theta, uh, those end up being the roses. And you remember the thing that distinguishes the two types is whether that, if, if we're talking about an integer value right here, whether that integer is even or odd. If it's odd, then you have 
as many petals as that number. So in this case, it's three. There should be three petals. Uh, what does that look like in Desmos? Let's flip over. And here is my rows. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Okay, now, how does this get traced? Well, if you check, it's definitely not period 2 pi. It's only period pi. And we talked about that when we went over that chart for the roses. Uh, how is this one traced? Well, when theta is 0, I obviously start here. Uh, as theta increases, might just picture in your mind the radial line shooting out from the origin. And as they rotate, it looks like r gets smaller as theta increases. And when I finally move back towards the pole, uh, what is the theta or what direction am I pointing in? It looks like I might actually be pointing in the direction of pi over 6. Now, how would I know that for sure? Uh, I would know that for sure by setting my 3 cosine 3 theta equal to 0 to see when I'm getting back to the pole. Because when r is 0, I'll be back to pole again. So I just set the function equal to 0, which of course means that cosine of 3 theta equals 0. Okay, as you begin rotating from 0, what's the first angle you hit where your cosine is 0? And it would be pi over 2. That means 3 theta would be equal to pi over 2. That means theta would be equal to pi over 6. Okay, so indeed pi over 6 um, is the theta value at which you have gone through a rotation of that pi over 6 and arrived back at the pole. Meaning what? Uh, since I have x-axis symmetry here with this pedal, I think we've already got uh, maybe our problem figured out. If I integrate from 0 to pi over 6, that would get me the top half of this pedal. Actually, if I wanted to, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of those half pedals. If I integrated from 0 to pi over 6 and got the top half of this pedal, I could just multiply that answer by 6. Okay, how else could I do it? Well, let's talk about a couple other possibilities. Um, if pi over 6 is where this pedal stops when it gets back to the origin. Notice that negative pi over 6 is where I'm at when I rotate down here clockwise and end up back at the pedal. So actually, if I integrated from negative pi over 6 to pi over 6, that would also get me the entire pedal. I could just multiply that value by 3. Uh, so by the way, let's let's uh, figure out the entire trace on this thing. So notice when I go from 0 to pi over 6, I trace out that top part of that pedal. Now, where do you go next? Well, what happens once you hit pi over 6 and you plug that into cosine of 3 theta? Well, now your 3 theta is going to be larger than pi, pi over 2. And once you pass pi over 2, cosine becomes negative, meaning once I pass pi over 6, my r's are going to be shooting backwards, tracing out this part. And if you do remember, when we talked about the roses, we said that the r's alternated between positive and negative when you went from petal to petal. So from 0 to pi over 6 gets me the top half of that petal. From pi over 6 to, oops, from pi over 6 to pi over 2 gets me this pedal. From pi over 2 down to, okay, where am I now? Looks like it is 5 pi over 6. That is, if I'm pointing straight up and I start rotating, what I'm going to trace out is this pedal. And then when I pass 2 pi over 3, I keep going. My radial lines are shooting out here coming down this curve, tracing it out. When I get back at the pole, my theta value is, sorry, I'm pointing to the wrong one. My theta value is 5 pi over 6. So again, 0 
to pi over 6, pi over 6 to pi, I'm sorry, pi over 2, let me repeat that, pi over 6 to pi over 2, pi over 2 to 5 pi over 6, and then what happens after that? Well, what's the only thing that we haven't traced out? It's the bottom half of this first petal. Well, from 5 pi over 6 down to pi, your r will again be negative, which will trace out this part. All right, so there are a lot of different combinations. Obviously, we said, uh, let's say this bottom petal, we said that was, what, pi over 6 to pi over 2. I could just do my integral formula from pi over 6 to pi over 2. That would get me this petal. We can do the negative pi over 6 to pi over 6, like we talked about in the beginning. I can do the 0 to pi over 6 and do 6 of those, because that would just be the top half of this. Uh, what was this petal over here? We said it was pi over 2 to 5 pi over 6. I can do that one, and there would be 3 of those. So there's lots of possible configurations here. Um, I like any integral where I can make one of the limits 0. So I'm always going to gravitate to the one, if I can, that starts at 0. So my choice would actually be the 0 to pi over 6, which would get me the top half of this pedal, and then do 6 of those. So let me go back here. So the one I'm going to pick is going to be 1 half integral 0 to pi over 6, um, f of theta squared, so 3 cosine of 3 theta squared d theta, but just remember that's one half of one of the three petals, so I would need six of those. And let's see, I don't think I actually did this one, uh, so I don't have a value for you to check on that one, but uh, that looks like a pretty easy integration. That's a nine cosine squared three theta, so I'd have to use my little uh, reduction identity, uh, cosine squared of a equals 1 plus cosine of 2a over 2, which means in this case I'd say cosine squared of 3 theta is 1 plus cosine of 6 theta over 2, and then from there it shouldn't be too hard to handle. Okay, so I guess the point of this example, if we're trying to make certain points with these, uh, this is another one that emphasizes uh, Number one, making sure you exploit symmetry if you've got it. Number two, ma making sure when you're trying to figure out those limits for the theta, uh, don't under or overestimate uh, the range of values it takes to trace out your curve. Remember that some of these polar curves don't have a period of 2 pi. Sometimes it's, it's just pi or, or some other multiple of pi or pi over 2. Okay, let's try another one. Let's see, let's find the area um, of the region lying between um, the, let's say, inner and outer loops, and I'll put loops in quotes of r equals 1 minus 2 sine theta. Okay, what does that one look like? It looks like this guy. Um, it's one of those Limachans with a loop. So let's see here. Um, if you recall, we uh, went through the tracing of one of these before, so let's watch this. It traces that first part. In fact, we did one like this. Uh, this is the example we did of a, a by-hand graphing problem. And we saw that r was positive, and then r was negative. r is still negative, r is negative. Now r is positive again, and then r stays positive the rest of the way. Now, just uh, to back up here for a second, 
that's going from theta equals 0 to theta equals whatever value I get that gets me back to the pole. And we know we can find that by setting our equation equal to 0. And then that loop will continue until the next point where the pole, where r is again 0. And it does turn out that that's going to be um, pi, I believe. I'm sorry, there's pi. And then from pi to 2 pi is going to trace out that big part. Now, what did we say we wanted in the problem? We wanted the area lying between the inner and outer loops. By inner loop, of course, I mean this guy. And by outer loop, I mean the big loop on the outside. So, of course, we're talking about the area in between the two. So everything outside this little teardrop here, but still inside the Limachon. So basically, everything inside this Limachon take away this area. Okay, now I think I just said how we should do it. We should find the area in inside this entire Limachon that is ignoring this teardrop for a minute. And then if I just subtract the, the teardrop, that would get me the area I want. Now the question is how to do that. Well, I need to find some values of theta where things start and end. Okay, and what I mean in particular is if we're going to subtract that teardrop, that is this loop, I need to know how to find the area of that loop. I need to know a starting value for theta and an ending value for theta. All right, so let's see here. There's the radial line pi over 6. And I will say that if you set this function 1 minus 2 sine theta to 0, you're going to get pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 as your solutions. Okay, so that means as theta rotates from 0, when does it get back to the pole at pi over 6? In other words, when I'm facing this direction, this theta equals pi over 6 direction, uh, that's when I get back to the pole. Okay, what happens once I pass pi over 6? Now my r's are negative for a while, which means when I rotate to, through these angles, my r takes me backwards and traces out this graph. And it keeps doing that all the way to this angle, except over here in quadrant 2, which is 5 pi over 6, which is this guy. Okay, that means if I want the area of this little teardrop, I should just integrate again from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, and I integrate the function. Now, notice the function is definitely following this curve, not this big curve out here. It's following this part when my theta is between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. All right, so let me write that down. We're saying 1 half times the integral of pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, um, the square of my polar function, which we said was 1 minus 2 sine theta. Okay, that's going to give me the area um, inside the inner loop. Okay, now the next question is going back to our picture. What do I do next? Well, we said we should find the area inside the big thing, that is, ignore the loop, and then we can just subtract the area of the loop. Now, again, there are multiple ways to do that, uh, but in my opinion, there is one that is most straightforward. Um, think about where we just stopped. So we stopped at that pi over 6 line after we ended the uh, pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6 swing that got us the inner loop. Okay, so what happens at pi over 6? We start following this part of the graph, right? So that means as we pass 5 pi over 6 and head towards pi, we'll be tracing out this part of the graph. Then what happens from pi to pi over 2? Our radial lines shoot out, they're positive, and they will trace out this big loop all the way over to 2 pi. Now, if I want the area inside this big loop, 
that is all of this including this little part here and this little part here wouldn't I still need to keep going from 0 to what would that be it was pi over 6 but now that I've done a full rotation that would be 7 pi over 6 so I claim that if we go from 5 pi over 6 all the way around to 2 pi and then we rotate another pi over 6 which would get us to 7 pi over 6 that would get us all of the area inside this whole thing and notice when I do that uh, when my radial lines shoot from the origin out to this curve that is between pi and 2 pi notice my radial lines go right through the teardrop that means I'm definitely filling up this area when I integrate the pi to 2 pi part. So putting that all together, I think my suggestion is I'm going to integrate 1 half integral 5 pi over 6 to, um, actually I think I said 7 pi over 6 and I definitely meant 13 pi over 6. Uh, everybody catch my correction there? That's 2 pi and I want to go another pi over 6 that's 12 pi over 6 I'm going 1 more pi over 6 so 13 pi over 6 1 minus 2 sine theta squared d theta I'm saying this would be the area of or let's say inside what I'm calling the big loop and that includes the little loop So, I think what we're saying is we should take this area inside the big loop and subtract this area inside the little loop. In other words, our area should be 1 half times the integral uh, big loop, which was 5 pi over 6 to 13 pi over 6, 1 minus 2 sine theta squared, minus the other area, which is the integral um, and let's put a d theta there minus the integral of the little loop which was the pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6 1 minus sine theta 1 minus 2 sine theta sorry squared d theta and there are some other ways to configure that, but that's that's the most straightforward because uh, I managed to do the entire big loop, that is everything inside this closed polar curve, um, ignoring the little loop. I was able to do that all with one integral, this one right here. Now there are other ways I could chop that up into other pieces. So for example, you should see that if I integrated from 0 to pi over 6, that would get me this little sliver that is everything above the x-axis and below this little arc of the polar curve if I did two of those that would get me these two slivers I could integrate from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi to get all of this stuff to the right of the y-axis except the sliver or I could just go 3 pi over 2 to 13 pi over 6 and multiply that by 2. That would be multiplying the two halves, uh, one of the halves by 2 to get both halves. So any way that's uh, legitimate to chop this up is fine. Um, I usually try and keep the pieces as big as I can, but it really just depends on how you see it. And there's so many different ways to chop this up into little pieces. Okay, let's look at one last example, and I'm trying to give you a little bit of everything here. So each, each one of these touches on a certain concept. So let's look at this last one, which is let's find the area of the region. Uh, now the way this one's worded is the area of the region that's common to r equals negative 6 
cosine theta and r equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta. And of course, I recognize that this one is a cardioid of some kind. And I recognize that this one is one of those circles that's tangent to one of the axes. Um, in this case, though, it's got a negative in front of it, so it's on the opposite side of the axis uh, from the side it was on in those pictures from our table. And so if I look at the pictures for this one, and sorry, I'm uh, doing it again. I'm not showing you what I'm writing. So r equals negative 6 cosine theta. That's the circle. r equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta. That's the cardioid. And if I get rid of these, there's negative 6 cosine theta. It's a circle of diameter 6, uh, tangent to the y-axis, but on the left side of the y-axis. And there's my cardioid in green. And you should be able to tell what I mean by the area common. I am talking about overlap or intersection there. So the area that's common is the area that's inside the circle and inside the cardioid. So that would be everything, loosely I could say it, everything that's right here to the right of the cardioid and to the left of the circle. It's this region in here. So uh, let me come over here on the paper and do a rough sketch of that, and I'll let you look at Desmos just for a moment while I draw my sketch, which uh, isn't going to be real pretty, but it will do. And so we're talking about something like, and by the way, before we go, uh, again, uh, invoking Desmos, it does look like the intersection here happens at 2 pi over 3, and then the other intersection down here looks like it's 4 pi over 3. And again, uh, we know that we could set our functions equal to each other, and then probably the other equation would be the negative of one of them equal to the other. But you've already seen at least one example where the, the basic equation, where you set the two polar functions equal to each other, can often capture everything. Now in this case, uh, the question is, uh, when I get to this point, is the r positive for both of these graphs? Well, when I rotate from 0, if I'm following the green graph, uh, starting at 0, do you notice that when theta is 0, I actually trace out this point? That means r is actually negative. And that means when I rotate from 0 to pi over 2, I'm actually going to be tracing out this part of the curve, this bottom part. And then when I rotate theta from pi over 2 to pi, I'll actually be tracing out this part. So notice what that says. It says that from 0 to pi over 2, my r is negative, which means I am tracing out things with radial lines like these. But then when I rotate from pi to I'm sorry, pi over 2 to pi, my r is positive. Okay, that means this part of the circle, which gets me to right there, is being traced out with positive r's and the actual theta that I've rotated to. Now, is that also true of the cardioid? And the answer is yes. The cardioid definitely traces from 0 to 2 pi, and r is positive at all times. Okay, what that means is if I set these two functions equal to each other, I will definitely pick up this point right here. Now, I won't pick up this point because notice on that one, r is positive for the green graph, but it's negative for the red graph. But that's okay. I know there's symmetry. And so if I figure out 2 pi over 3 is the intersection up here, I know this one's going to be 4 pi over 3 down here. All right, so with all that in mind, let's draw a picture over here in our sketchbook of what we're looking for and sorry that's a really bad picture but it'll work um, actually no it won't let me redraw that give me just a second okay 
another quick sketch still looks pretty bad but it's it's better and in fact let me zoom in a little bit here and let's draw a couple of radial lines we said that the one intersection happened at theta equals two pi over three and we said the other one down here by symmetry was going to be theta equals four pi over three All right now what are we looking for we're looking for the area inside both curves and just to be clear that means we're definitely talking about all of this stuff because that's inside the cardioid all the way over to the blue like so okay notice then that means uh, there are two areas of interest here and I'll try to uh, shade this in let's use uh, let's use purple so do you see that uh, that little sliver right there what are the two boundaries of that little sliver well the two boundaries are the line theta equals 2 pi over 3 and the blue graph that is the circle so here let me do those uh, let me do those both in red just to highlight it so I'm saying that little sliver has two boundaries to it on the bottom side of it it's this radial line theta equals 2 pi over 3 but on the top it's the arc of that circle that is that negative 6 cosine theta okay but what happens once you hit theta equals 2 pi over 3 well from there on do you see that and I'll do this in uh, let's say green do you see that now when the radial lines emanate from the origin they're tracing out the green curve okay that means what happened there is when I went from 0 to 2 pi over 3 um, I actually switched which function was the boundary and actually let's be very careful there and this is the part where you could get tripped up if you weren't being careful uh, let me pick some crazy color like this orange here the question is um, if this is the first part I'm going to integrate where does that part of the circle start you should notice it's not at theta equals zero we said when theta was zero we were actually here and then when I rotated theta from zero to pi over two what I did is trace out this part of the curve okay that means when I get to pi over two I'm facing this way and now when I start rotating from pi over two to two pi over three that's what's going to trace out this part of the circle this little part that I have shaded in fact I'll do it again in a different color this little guy right here he is now traced out from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3 so if I explode that what we're saying is if this is the origin and here's my circle and there's my line of theta equals 2 pi over 3 um, I have to integrate from pi over 2 to pi over 3 so I'm swinging through that angle and as I do what's getting traced out it's this part of the circle and as I do that I am filling in that little sliver okay that's important because this is akin to those problems you used to do in calc 1 where your boundary would switch remember those problems you would do where you would find the area let's say below this curve and above that curve and let's say at this point uh, that upper function was really split into two parts um, this could have been one function and this could have been some other function so that means of course you had to figure out what this was you had to figure out what this was you had to figure out what this was you had to do one integral for this part you had to do a different integral for this part well that's what's happening in your picture over here from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3 is this sliver now 
what happens once I hit 2 pi over 3? Well, again, if I keep rotating, what happens when I get down to pi over 2? I have filled in all of this part, the part that I've just shaded in in a solid green. And you see that if I put those two together, the lime green and the dark green, that is the area of the top of this common region that we're talking about. And since I know this guy has symmetry, I can see that either from looking at Desmos or from doing a symmetry test, I should just be able to integrate and multiply by 2. So let's uh, carefully write out what we're saying here. We're saying that if we integrate 1 half pi over 2 to pi over 6, and when I do, what is the function I'm following? It's the circle negative 6 cosine of theta squared. Okay, that's going to give me the area of that little lime green sliver. What happens when I get to, okay, I'm sorry, it's not pi over 6. That's crazy what I just wrote there. We do mean, of course, 2 pi over 3. Sorry about that. Okay, now what happens when you get to 2 pi over 3? Well, now you're going to catch this part. Now, when you catch that part, what is your boundary? It's this guy, which is the cardioid. So that means I need to switch to the cardioid. It's plus 1 half integral 2 pi over 3. And if I rotate down to theta equals pi over 2, that will catch everything I have shaded in dark green there. And what's that function we're following? It's the cardioid 2 minus 2 cosine theta. So I'll square that and integrate with respect to theta. Now, what am I missing? That's the area of the top half of this common area in between the two curves. I would just want to multiply the whole thing by 2, which essentially means getting rid of those 1 halves. So what I'm left with is this integral plus this integral. Alright, so again, uh, sorry for the picture. I probably could have drawn that a little better. So in fact, I, I will draw it one more time just to emphasize what's going on here. So uh, let me scroll up a little bit. And so what we're saying, and I'll try to do a little better this time. One, two, three, four, five, six up 1, 2, 3, up down 2, 3, and so we're saying roughly a circle that looks like so. Yeah, it's still not great, but it's I think it's a little better. Now the cardioid is the part I won't get so well. Uh, so that's 0, that'll go to 2 and negative 2. Uh, when I'm at pi that will be 4 and this was 6 out here so roughly it's going to be something like this all right now let's blow this up again and let's see if I can do this a little bit better uh, the problem is the just haven't given myself enough here to show you. There's, there's probably about as good as I'm going to get. There's my intersection point. So do you see that when I start at pi over 2 and I begin to rotate, if I integrate the circle function, I'm going to be following the graph of the circle. And if I start at pi over 2, that would be this part. If I integrate from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3, I'm going to trace out that green arc of the circle, which means I'm going to be filling in this area. All right, now what happens once I get to 2 pi over 3? Well, then I switch so that my boundary function is now the red function, that is the cardioid. So from 2 pi over 3 down to pi, I'm filling up this region, everything between the origin and the cardioid. And that looks really terrible, but 
you get the idea. I'm filling in all of this. And so when I integrate from 2 pi over 3 to pi, I'm going to get that area right there. Add them together, and that is half of the common area that you were after. There's the top half. Down here is the bottom half. Multiply by 2, and we've got it. That one right there is about as tricky as we're going to get. And it's only tricky in the sense that you uh, had to notice that where that intersection happened, you actually had to change your outer function. But if you, uh, you know, if you draw it carefully, or never mind drawing it, if you just look at Desmos carefully, um, you know, let's look at Desmos instead of relying on my terrible drawing. When I draw a radial line, in fact, right there it is for me, I can see that from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3, the graph I'm following to get the common region is this one. But then once I hit 2 pi over 3, it switches to this graph. So I have to think about the actual region I'm shading. And the actual region I'm shading is the one that starts here, follows the red, hits that intersection point, follows the green, follows the green all the way down, hits the other intersection point, follows the red back up, and hits the origin. That means... I need to figure out what will trace out this part. And obviously, I need to stop following that part when I get to 2 pi over 3. OK, the trick is, and this is the one thing that might have been hard to notice, where does this section start on the red graph? It starts at pi over 2. And if you have to use that other Desmos program that I have the link for that allows you to watch it being traced, so you can figure out where that theta is, where it starts tracing out this part of the red curve. Uh, use that. That could be useful for that sort of thing. OK, I think you've got plenty of examples. I haven't actually given you a ton of problems. Uh, so hopefully this will give you plenty to go by. Uh, let me know if you have questions, and we'll stop there.